Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Sharon Celine, and I'm so excited to be here. Uh, we are shifting our model for Facebook Lives to once a month, so I am very happy to be back. Um, I'm excited about our conversation today, which is about conversations. So I'm looking forward to a lively um, Facebook Live session with you. Uh, when you uh, log on, if you would tell me where you're from and what's something that is a little tough for you in conversations. Um, I know for me, my challenge is interrupting. And it's not something that I'm proud of. It's actually something I'm not very proud of, um, but it's something that I do. And sometimes it's because people are long talkers. Sometimes it's because um, I have other stuff I want to do and I, I can't really listen. Um, but in general, it's not the, the way that I want to be in the world because I want people to feel listened to and valued. So if you could just um, say hi in the chat uh, tell me where you're from, and one thing uh, that makes conversations a little bit challenging for you. That would be great. And Gina, you are our first winner. Uh, thank you so much for uh, introducing yourself, and you're from Florida, where I bet the weather is nicer than it's been up here in Massachusetts in the last few days. We've had quite a storm in New England. I'm lucky because we it's most of it's melted but um i have friends in vermont who got 17 inches and a friend in maine who got 22 inches so i'm um, very happy with my um one you know two to three inches of snow that's already melted uh, i thought the saying was april showers bring may flowers not april snow showers bring may flowers but oh well Hello, Callum from the UK. Great to have you. So I want to welcome all of you. And again, one of the things that makes these Facebook Lives so special is the community that we have. So when you introduce yourself and let me know where you're from, um, I uh, would really be happy to, um, to, to meet you. Um, Jennifer is from Malta. Wow, that's really wonderful. I have never um, been there, and that sounds really exciting. Um, I'm putting up a free downloadable for those of you who are joining. Uh, Gina says, I also interrupt, sometimes talk too loud or too fast. Other times I can't think of anything to say, and that makes me feel like I'm not very smart. Chanda is, or, or Chanda, or I don't know if you go by Shonda or Chanda. Uh, you're from Texas, and sometimes you talk too much. Got it. Well, we know that conversations can be tough for people with ADHD. Um, it, tracking the flow, staying focused on the subject, or sometimes talking about a topic that seems relevant and related to you, but might feel tangential to other people. Then there's the volume and tone of your voice, reading facial expressions, and difficulty gauging physical proximity. Are you standing too close? Are you standing too far away? Um, or sometimes maybe being overcritical in your mind of what you are or are not doing that you think you should be doing, or worrying what someone is thinking about you rather than being present with what's going on. Hi, Tracy. Hi, Trey. Tracy from Calgary. Um, you had a huge dump of snow this week, too. Luckily, melting. Uh, you struggle with interrupting because my brain is running too fast. And if I don't say it now, it will be gone forever. And apparently, that is important. LOL. Hi, Margaret from Illinois. Welcome. So, some of you have mentioned that interrupting is some, something that you struggle about. Gina, you say not getting the facts straight and then worrying that someone might think you're lying. So sometimes interrupting others frequently leads to misunderstandings, um, frustration, and strained relationships. Some people with ADHD um, may interrupt you know, on purpose. They, they just, they just um, they want to say something, they are worried they can't hold it in their brain, and so they interrupt. But for other people, it might reflect weaker working memory or verbal impulse control um, or, you know, sort of a, a self-awareness. Um, Cuckoo says you're Polish in Edinburgh, Scotland, and you don't like small talk. Mm, a lot of people don't. Um, 
Sometimes you may not remember to wait your turn because you don't trust yourself to hold on to what you want to say uh, uh, so that you can participate later. Um, and or you may feel like you have to prove yourself and establish your expertise early on in the conversation. Um, uh, perhaps you're afraid of of um, of, of worrying that there won't be a pause in the conversation for you to actually say what you're thinking. Or you, um, you really, really want to engage in a conversation, but you can't find a way in, uh, so you interrupt. You may be very excited about this topic and eager to discuss it, um, and so that might be another reason that you interrupt. Erica, welcome. You interrupt too, and I'm scared you can't get it out. Mm -hmm. I hear you. So the urge to interrupt is, of course, uh, also affected by anxiety. And the more anxious that you feel in a social situation, the higher the likelihood there is that you will interrupt. Um, anxiety will exacerbate any kind of nervousness or worries about acceptance, about performance or embarrassment. And when you're flooded with these kinds of intense feelings, you can be naturally more impulsive as a protective measure and less capable of monitoring your words and your actions. Kit Kat Anderson says, hi from Maryland, anxious all the time, people pleaser. Hmm. A lot of us struggle with that. Uh, wanting to get it right and be perfect, um, making p other people happy, sometimes at our own expense. Christine uh, says my son can't explains that he can't control his interruptions, and that's true for a lot of people with ADHD because of the way that emotional control and impulse control work together in, in terms of um, how uh, they influence working memory. And so, you know, working memory is that part of our memory where we hold something and we do a task on it. And if you're in a conversation, having working memory lets you have an idea and hold on to it so when other people are finished you're speaking, you can circle back and share your thought. And for people who struggle with uh, working memory challenges, and you're not sure that you can trust yourself to hold on to that thought and so you want to get it out. For people who struggle with slower processing speed, you may, you, may, you may not interrupt, but you may have trouble following the conversation and then when you finally catch up, you start to say something that was actually relevant five minutes ago. Um, uh, so one of the things that we understand is that um, we have to try to manage ourselves in conversations with more confidence and more regulation. Debbie says, one of my worst traits interrupting, it hurts my marriage. Oh, I know, Debbie. My, husband's, my husband says to me, I'd like you to, you know, don't put your, leave your things on the counter, turn off the garage light when you come in, and also could you interrupt less? And I say, which one? And he's like, the interruption part. I'm like, is that your top priority? He's like, that's my top priority. And shoot, the garage light would be so much easier. So let's take a minute now um, and think about how you feel when someone interrupts you. Does it seem like they aren't listening, but rather waiting for their turn to talk? Is the interrupter demonstrating that their thoughts are more important than yours? How does this make you feel? Are you angry, unimportant, dismissed, maybe feel unseen? Even though interrupting may demonstrate this lack of effective impulse control on your part, other people may not understand this and become irritated or impatient. They probably feel like you do when they're interrupted. Now, I know that for me and with my husband, he's a bit of a long talker. He tells a long story. I call it taking the long way home. And so when he starts to tell a story and he's going on, I'll say, can you do the shortened version, please? And that way I know I can pay attention to the whole story. But when he goes on for a long time, you know, maybe five minutes, um, it, it's a long time for you to listen. And, and that takes practice. Um, um, so, so 
and with our partners as in couples, we easily get frustrated more than we might with, you know, a client I have who's going on for five minutes. I'm paying attention. Uh, they have my full attention. But at home, I'm also, you know, I'm having dinner with him. I'm thinking about what I need to do to clean up the kitchen or what I'm going to do after dinner. And so there's a little bit of that that's interrupting my ability to fully listen. Many people with ADHD uh, go on tangents when they are telling a story or sharing what's on their mind. We call that oversharing. Do you do that? I do that sometimes. And then I try to like, you know, I want to take it back and I might apologize or I just feel embarrassed and I might, you know, sort of stop participating. So one of my clients recited aloud for me what he was thinking, and it was literally a nonstop train of observations, interpretations, ideas, and curiosity about everything that was in my office. How many of you think that your brain does this too? If you think that your brain has multiple ideas simultaneously, which might make it hard for you, A, to stay on track when you're telling a story, B, to give your full attention when you're listening, and C, to control your desire to interrupt, please let me know in the chat, because I think the rest of us would like to know that we're not alone, that many of us are struggling with this. So um, sometimes these ideas can lead to side talking in conversations or side, oh, side tracking where you go off track and you may not realize that you're far down a different road that was the one that's different than the, the that's separate from the one that you started and isn't really going where you wanted to go when you started until someone tells you or people start looking away maybe nervously or maybe they confront you directly and sometimes not so nicely. Um, all too often, kids and adults with ADHD become defensive, feeling angry and ashamed at the same time. And these feelings can make things worse for you socially and contribute to feeling excluded or humiliated. So let's look at some strategies for reducing interruptions after I see some of your comments. I'm really appreciating these comments. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, Margaret, uh, oh, excuse me. Bobby says, that's what I tell my husband. No backstory, get to it. <laughs> oh, I like that. Uh, Margaret, I'm always going on tangents. Kit Kat, how do we protect ourselves in the workplace? That's a good question, Kit Kat. I will come back to that. Um, Trey says, yes. Uh, C says song lyric association and then start singing in the middle of the conversation. Okay, Gina, yes. Erica, I interrupt all the time and I'm afraid if I don't act or say something, I'll forget. Yep, that's me, angry and ashamed, which leads me to being insecure about friendships and even family trying to determine if they're genuine. Oh, I get this. This is fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Um, that um, it's not fantastic that you live with this, but it is a beautiful way of articulating what so many people with ADHD experience and tell me. So let's look at some strategies for reducing interruptions. And I'm actually going to um, put some of these in the chat for you, okay? So the first thing is write things down. This is particularly useful Kit Kat at work when you're in a meeting. Use your phone or in a meeting a pad of paper or you know if you can keyboard and you let people know that you're not shopping on Amazon uh, or whatever that you're actually just taking notes um, or maybe record the meeting and then have it uh, transcribed through Otter or something like that. So we want to write things down using your phone or a small pad of paper that keep that you keep with you to jot down a few key words that will cue you to recall what it is that you want to say. So if you're in a meeting or you're hanging out with friends, let other people know that you don't want to interrupt so you're taking some notes while other people are talking. That helps you remember your thoughts a little bit better. Um, this prepares them in case you choose to do this and wards off judgment. This is very helpful at work. I've had a couple clients, you know, sort of um, kind of pre-game with their colleagues and their supervisors that they're going to be taking some notes or recording the session um, and so they don't because I don't want to miss any 
anything. Um, and, and people are very much appreciative of that effort. Here's the second one. Um, oops, Eric has a question, so I'm going to answer that before I do the second one. So let's see. So I write things down, but I struggle keeping things in one place. Any suggestions? I would divide things by uh, by the con, like the um, the situation. So if you have a meeting uh, that's on a particular topic, then we want to arrange things by topic, or maybe you want to do it by dates. Figure out a system of organizing that makes sense to you. So for me, I like to go topic oriented. Um, because that's how my brain works. But I know some people who prefer to organize by dates, some people who prefer to organize um, you know, by, th by, um, by, by, th by greater themes rather than just the topic of the meeting. All right, so here's the second thing, which is be candid. If you don't want to write things down, say, I have something to share, but I don't want to interrupt you. I'm afraid that I'll forget it. So let's be accountable that we have a little trouble holding on to our thoughts. And then this warns people of why you might be interrupting. You will have to monitor how many times you do this though, because more than a few times in a conversation is too much. If you happen to forget something, don't worry about it. It'll probably come back to you later, or you can text them. It's okay to forget what you wanted to say, or to pause, or if you're in a job interview or in a conversation, say, hmm, that's a really good question. Let me think about that for a minute. Or can I think about it and get back to you? You can buy yourself time um, in, in a lot of situations by validating the, um, the val by validating the importance of that question and the need that you might have to reflect on it. Okay, so um, here's, an, here's, I think, a very big reason why some of us struggle with interrupting. Oops. Watch out for overwhelm. Parties, meetings, gatherings at a park if you're taking your child to go to the playground, um, eating dinner at a busy restaurant, all of these environments can be extra distracting. And it will be harder for you naturally to track what's being said by whom and stay with the conversation. That is not a failure on your part. That's just a combination of having a, a neurodivergent brain in a situation that is, that is actually not uh, geared for living with a neurodivergent brain, right? Because you're outside and there's lots of stimulation. There can be stimulation inside too. But more often when we're in an environment where there's stimulation, we'll get distracted will get overwhelmed and it might be harder to pay attention to the person we're with it might be harder to follow the conversation and it may be harder for you to um, monitor your interruptions so if you can't hear what someone is saying or you can't focus on what they're saying let them know I'm having trouble focusing on what you're saying because this restaurant is so loud and distracting. Or can we step away from the noise? Or could we, you know, sit closer so I can hear you better? I find that in a lot of restaurants today, and it could be my age, but I the music is very loud. And the music is so distracting and it's like in my ears pounding. And I'm trying to have conversations with people and I have to shout for, uh, to, to be heard. They might be a, like a soft talker and I can't hear what they're saying and I'll ask them to repeat it. And the whole experience kind of goes down the drain for me because I leave and my ears hurt and I feel like I haven't been able to connect with somebody. So, you know, think about where you're going to meet people and what the, um, what the what the environment is like you know a, a park might be much more pleasant having a picnic if the weather's good than having lunch at a restaurant for example um so i don't i don't feel um <laughs> erica says um uh, it's not your age i'm i'm starting to feel old i'm only 36 and debbie says it's not your age i don't think it is my age i think it's the need for stimulation that people think people who own restaurants think that the people who are eating need to have, you know, I mean, music is fine as long as it's not, 
you know, the dominant noise in the restaurant because, you know, you can have the voices and the music and it's so loud. And that I, I find difficult. Um, uh, Bobby says it's exhausting in crowds. Crowds can be exhausting. That's not going to be a time where you're going to have an intimate, you know, per you know, conversation. A crowd is a time where you're going to have more of that chit chat, which I think someone earlier said, I hate chit chat. So we'll be talking about that in a minute. So we want to watch out for overwhelm and try as best as we can either to, you know, avoid, sort of um, set up gatherings with people not in situations that will overwhelm us. Um, or if you're in a situation that's overwhelming, try to find a quiet place or ask for a quiet table. Um, I've asked in restaurants for them to please turn the music down. Um, because I don't care anymore what people think about that when I'm at a restaurant. Um, Erica says, a lot of people who feel overstimulated even without neurodivergent thinking. Yes. And Debbie says, music to eat by has changed over the years. <laughs> Hi, Mary. So glad you're here. Don't worry about it. Okay, so what's another thing that you can do in conversation um, to sort of um, help you um, reduce interruptions? Um, what, another thing that you can do is to listen and ask questions. So people like to talk about themselves. They also like to feel heard. Think about yourself. You want to say some things. You want to know that the person's listening and hearing you. The best way for us to do that is with reflective listening in a conversation. Ah, what I heard you say is, tell me more about that. Or that sounds interesting. Can you describe it uh, um, a bit uh, further? Or could you explain that in more detail? We want to ask ourselves, this, th use this acronym to ask ourselves, why are we talking? Why am I talking now? And I call that wait now. So this is, you know, just periodically if I, I want to check in and with myself when I'm in a situation, am I talking too much? Am I talking too loud? Um, you know, just once, once, you know, maybe an hour um, or, le or more, you know, once in the evening I want to check in with myself. If something happens and I'm not feeling good, then I would want to check in with myself as well. But you don't want to do it every five minutes. It's something like you're in a conversation, um, you might notice that people are turning away or, you know, they're drinking and not looking at you or um, they excuse themselves. That's time to ask yourself, you know, what, why am I talking now and what is it, what, what, what's happening with what I'm saying? You also will want to um, ask clarifying questions of the person who's speaking. You know, hmm, I don't quite understand that. Could you explain that a little bit more? Or that, that sounds um, really different. I've never heard that. Uh, I'd like to know more about it. Something like that would be helpful. Um, and remember that putting a pause in a sentence doesn't mean that the f person is finished speaking. So what happens is people might be in saying something and then they, they stop to take a breath uh, or to swallow or something and you may jump in with your comment and they're not finished speaking and they'll say, well, I wasn't finished. And then of course you'll start to do a whole number on yourself. Oh my gosh, I interrupted. What is wrong with me? Blah, blah, blah. Instead of saying, you know what? I'm sorry, I couldn't tell from that pause if you were finished or not, which is the truth. You couldn't tell. And so this is the way that I think being honest and accountable is very helpful. Just like tossing it off a little bit, not making it such a big deal. If you're not sure if someone's taking a pause because they're finished or because they need some air or they're thinking, wait 10 seconds and then, you know, say what you want to say. Now the last, uh, the last step in interruptions is, you know, really, you know, seeking some feedback. So you want to ask a trusted friend or a family member for honest feedback on your conversational skills. Their insights can provide valuable perspective and help you identify areas for um, improvement. So this means seeking feedback, but you can only seek feedback from someone where you feel safe.
with that person, um, where you're not going to be kind of destroyed emotionally by what they say. And this is challenging for people with um, ADHD and rejection sensitive dysphoria. But getting some feedback in a situation, particularly if it doesn't go so well for you, can, can help you make essential changes in your um, habit of interrupting. So we have some comments here, let's see. Um, it, it, Gemma says, drives me mad that when I talk to my partner, he doesn't listen and scrolls on his phone. Gemma, I am so with you on that. And I think that's a really interesting thing for us to think about. You know, when 20 years ago, when these were um, really not very much available, to be honest, um, if, you, if people were looking at their phone instead of participating in the conversation or looking at you, that would be considered rude. Today, it's very common and it's accepted for someone to look at their phone while you're talking to them. And I think it, the, the, the experience of the other person is that they, are, they don't matter. They're not important enough for you to not look at your phone and pay attention to them. Um, this is why if you are in a conversation and you, you, know, you get a, a text on your watch or something on your phone and you look at it, you, want, you might want to say something like, oh, well, you know, my, my, um, my, teen, my teen is at a sleepover and I just want to you know, have, check to make sure everything is okay if that's them or my mom is in the hospital so I, I, I want to check or whatever it is to explain why you're checking rather than just, oh, you're not that interesting, which is what you're showing with your behavior and looking at your phone. Um, my fiance does not, okay. My fiance does not understand this at all. When I would try to ask him questions, he would tell me I was interrupting. So Mary, what you might want to do is ask fewer questions and ask your fiance you know, if he can signal to you, or when is a good time for you to ask your questions? Because, you know, the fact is we have limited attention spans. And so rather than, you know, getting into it, really say, you know, like, I have some questions. How, you know, can I signal to you with my hand that I have a question? Because then you will know that I want to, I have a question and I don't have to interrupt you, but I'm signaling that I have something I want to say. Um, Mary says, but if I don't talk and ask, I'll forget my question or my thought. So then this is a good time to have that little pad of paper around and jot down some things for you. Not on your phone for some of the reasons I just described. So now that um, we've talked about how to manage your interruptions, let's look at some strategies for participating in conversations effectively with ADHD. So the first thing we want to think about, and I'm going to put these in the chat for you because I know that many people with ADHD are visual learners. You need to see it written down. So I, again, I, I have a, that handout on social anxiety, um, which is at the top of the, um, the thread, and I'll put it in again in a minute. So we want to consider personal space, volume, and body language. This is a key conversational skill. So how close are you standing to people? In the United States, in our culture, it's about an arm's length, right? Um, that's about three feet apart. So you, want to, um, you also want to think about your hand gestures and touching others. You may come from a culture where people, you know, put their, you know, will touch somebody on, it, on their arm or on their shoulder as very common. Um, and some people are super uncomfortable with being touched um, and uh, ca even casually during an exchange. So initially, keep your hands and your body parts to yourself. I talk a lot with my hands, as you can probably know, as you can probably tell, and that's something that I'm aware um, can be distracting for people. And so I do try to kind of um, monitor that. Um, uh, later, if, if you want, you can share that you talk a lot with your hands uh, or maybe and ask if it's okay to tap, you know, tap on the shoulder or something like that. Check out the volume of the conversation. How loud are people speaking? Are you speaking louder or quieter than the people around you? Can you hear yourself? Do you have a buddy who can signal you that you're too loud or too soft? Um, to be honest, sometimes my hu my husband is I love him dearly, and sometimes he is a loud talker, and I'm like, can you lower the volume, please? I don't even I'm not even there's no signal anymore. It doesn't work because he just doesn't pay it doesn't notice it. So I'll just say, 
can we can you just talk a little softer please that's usually what i say could we talk a little bit softer too please um um because it gets excited you know people get excited and their voice gets louder and so just can we bring it down a notch um uh, we want to observe the facial expressions and the body language of the people around me. Interest and engagement look open and calm. You relax posture, eye contact, you're leaning forward. Judgment and discomfort look more closed, crossed arms and legs looking away. What are people's faces and bodies showing you about their responses to what you're saying? Remember that they're, what they're showing you is much more about them than it is about you. So you don't need to take it personally, but it might be a signal for you to, you know, engage in a little self-awareness. Am I talking too loud? Am I going on too long? Am I off topic? These things can be very useful. The next thing that I think, uh, it, you know, which is part of this, is to really reflect on your behavior in conversations. So if you're not comfortable with eye contact, can you look here at where someone's hairline is? Um, maybe engage in activity for someone who can't actually maintain eye contact. So particularly if you're a parent and you have kids, um, teenagers, emerging adults, um, that you might want to, or friends, that you, know, you can do something and have a conversation simultaneously, walking, sometimes bicycling, maybe going shopping or, um, going to a, a baseball game or visiting a museum or playing tennis. A lot of people have conversations throughout uh, activities. Um, when you enter a room, do you pause? Do you observe what's going on? Many folks with ADHD, and I have to say I'm guilty of this myself, I do this, guilty, I don't know if that's the right word, I do this, is I'll enter a room, um, like I'll, I'll be in a room, and then I'll leave to use a bathroom or something, and then I come back to the conversation, and I don't pause to I, long enough to get a sense of what they're talking about. I wait a few seconds, and then I'll say like, well, what exactly are you talking about? It's not enough time, and it's intrusive. And I don't want to be that way. So um, I have learned to start of to start to reflect a little bit on pausing a little bit longer. I've left the conversation. I said I'll be back. I've now I'm now back. Zip it, Sharon, for a little while, a couple minutes, so that you can catch up. And if you don't understand, then you can ask a question. I'm a little confused about what we're talking about. That's okay. Um, so. Um, and the other thing is we really want to make a plan for when we lose focus, okay? So I'm putting this down. Make a plan for when you, um, when you, oops, excuse me, when you start to get uh, distracted or interrupted. Oh, excuse me, when you start to get distracted, space out, or start interrupting. So if you lose focus when someone's talking, watch their mouth or their hand gestures or find a place that you can look so you're, you have a place for your focus to go and your ears can continue to work. Um, uh, this is why a lot of people knit um, or, or, do, or something uh, while, it, while they're having conversations, quilting. I mean, quilters and knitters are always doing something with their hands um, this is where fidgets come in while, and, and that kind of takes away the zzzz, uh, the of the distracting stuff in, in, uh, in their, um, neurotypical brain, neuro, neurodivergent brains, excuse me. And then, um, so that they can participate in conversations, uh, in ways that seem more neurotypical. So, um, uh, ask open-ended questions that begin with how and what more than why. Uh, how do you get back into a conversation once you've drifted off? So one of the problems is that you, you drift off and then you come back and then you've drifted off but the conversation has moved on and so you're embarrassed and so then you might, because you're anxious or embarrassed, start to um, 
you know, uh, draw, sort of ask too many questions or, you know, say what, what, or, um, you know, or say, yeah, I agree. And someone's like, it wasn't a yes or no question. So is there someone who's in the conversation who you can sort of whisper, lean to and whisper, say, hey, what, what are we talking about now? So it's not a whole group awareness. Or if you're with one person to say, you know what, I'm really sorry, but my brain went to the Bahamas. Um, this has nothing to do with you. It's my brain. Could we, could you just repeat what you just said? I, I lost track. Um, or maybe I'm having trouble following you. Can we slow down? Or could you repeat that? Um, if there's some sort of signal to communicate um, to you if you kind of wandered off topic while you're talking or maybe you've been talking too long like maybe they pull their ear or they touch their nose just like in the sting um, the movie with Paul Newman and Robert Redford that was when I was growing up and it's actually a classic so probably most of you may know it um, So we want to understand that in social situations, it's natural to feel awkward. It's natural sometimes in conversations to be uncertain about what to say, when to say it, and how to say it. Um, so I'm just adding that uh, downloadable for you in case you missed it uh, about social anxiety. So what we want to be able to do is um, to learn how to feel awkward or uncomfortable without judging ourselves. Everybody has insecurities, whether they show them to you or not. You know, some people, I'm one of these people, I wear my emotions on my sleeve. You can tell how I'm doing. I'm, I have a, a terrible, a very bad probable poker face. I don't play poker, so I can't say, but I assume I'd have a bad one. Um, uh, but, um, you know, I, that's one of the things that also is, is one of the, the parts of myself I really love, being genuine and authentic. So um, there are other people, though, who look like they're totally okay. They're, they're much better at, a, at what's called a poker face. And inside, they have all kinds of stuff going on. You know, maybe they're masking, and masking is, is something that might be helping them manage the turmoil they feel inside. Maybe they're masking out of discomfort to, so that they can feel like they can fit in, which is kind of, you know, something that we do. We hide what's going on so that we feel like we can, you know, join others. Um, you know, which is different than camouflaging, which is, you know, where we, um, where we, uh, you know, try to be like other people so that we can fit in. And, and then what we're still hiding ourselves underneath. So masking and camouflaging are definitely related. So just because you might be uncertain uh, about uh, something or worried about how other people might perceive you doesn't mean you should stop making social connections and engage in conversations. Instead, armed with the tools and strategies that we've talked about today, and that Attitude has many, many of them on their website, um, you can feel more confident and courageous in, in meeting new people, in talking with the people you already know, in participating in, in meetings and on projects at work, and making lasting friendships. Um, so you can't have access that is the free handout not working um please don't tell me that that would be very upsetting for me um it, is it is it true that the free handout is not working um i will uh, uh if someone else can tell me if they've been able to download it that would be great stephanie says i'm introverted and shy ain't no way i'm asking anyone what the conversation is about okay Thanks for letting me know. Ever. Okay. Not when I've drifted off. Not when I've dr not when I've drifted off. I keep quiet unless I'm asked something directly. If I drift off, I just stand there keeping quiet and knowing not knowing what is going on as I'm definitely not asking. I'm so glad that you brought this up, Stephanie, because you know, um uh, you're very clear about what you will and will not do, which is great. It's good to know yourself. Um and the thing is, when you've drifted off and you come back from the drift and you don't know what's going on, how are you feeling? 
And how does it happen that you catch up? I'd like to know what you do to catch up in those situations because asking your, is, uh, what's going on isn't for everyone. You're right. And particularly for people who have you know, in, you know, pretty intense RSD or um, struggle a lot with social anxiety. So what do you do when, you, when you're standing there? How do you learn what is going on? Uh, okay, thank you, Becky, for telling me that. Click on it. We haven't been able to download it either. Hmm. I don't know why that might be. So let me try it myself. Hold on. I'm going to try it myself. Okay. It does work for me. So. Um, does anyone else want, have experience uh, what, what um, Stephanie does, which is you're not going to ask other people, no matter what, what's going on. And if you don't ask what's going on, what do you do instead? Please tell me, Stephanie, wh and others who, who don't want to ask, which I understand because it is hard to ask, uh, what do you do instead? I know that when I'm in a conversation at, or I've stepped away from conversation or um, I miss something someone was saying, I, I try to wait. I try to wait um, if I can and otherwise I may just say, excuse me, I missed what you were saying, could you say it again? Because I am not, um, I am, I'm, I'm, I'm not particularly shy, although I do get um, embarrassed about things that I do. I don't think I'm particularly shy. So um, I'd love to know what you do in those situations that is helpful when you, you, know, you don't know exactly how to catch up. C, my vagueness is part of my eccentricity. Uh, I suppose I accept it. Um, it looks like the form to enter your email address is not appearing on the page. Oy. Okay, hold on a second. Let me see if I can get something else that works because I want you guys to have something. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, so let me see how this works. You're right. The form is not there. Oh my. I'm so sorry about that. So you know what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to give you um, a form on uh, rejection sensitive dysphoria. I th hopefully this one works. It does. So I'm going to give this to you instead. It's not the same. Um, and the next time that we get back together, I'll have something on social anxiety for you. Here you go. Sorry about that. All right, let's see what people are saying. Um, okay, Kathy. Sometimes when I have a conversation with someone new, my eyes tear up as a reaction. It's so embarrassing because then they think I'm crying. My son has the same reaction and it's frustrating to him as well. We're not sad. It's just the reaction we have talking to new people. You know, what I would do in those situations when you're meeting someone and you feel that happening, say, you know, this, is, this may sound a little strange. But sometimes when I meet new people, for some reason my eyes tear up. I'm not sad. I'm not upset. It's just this reaction that happens in my body, you know, so that you, you're sort of warding off their judgment later by letting them know this is going to happen and predicting it. Mm -hmm. This happens to me. Okay, the free gift is working. I'm so glad. Uh, any other, like, questions that you might have about you know, interrupting or how to have effective conversations. This will be a great time to ask because we're almost out of, t we're almost at the end of our session. Um, Chandra says, uh, I get bored easily during a conversation and try to move the conversation to a deeper level away from small talk. I know this is rude, but I need it to stay engaged. You know, um, <laughs> I'll, yeah, people, many people with ADHD do not like small talk. 
they don't like chit chat. It's 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 it does it, it it's not super compelling. And so what you might want to do, I don't think that's rude necessarily. Um, I think that if you are um, asking clarifying questions that show that you're interested in somebody, that's not necessarily rude. That's actually you know moving towards a deeper level of engagement. And and I would imagine that someone would feel flattered by that. That showing how much you're interested. Um, Mary says it's a string attachment usually. I think you're talking about what's wrong with my um, my downloadable, and I'll I'll get on that. Um, Mary, you also said you sway constantly. It's my stem, really, and you're correct. I don't like chit chat at all. I need to have an intellectual conversation. So we can't always. Ha- I, first of all, thanks for saying that, and I think moving in a conversation is is can be very helpful. Um, Oh, you, 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 okay. Um, and, uh, um, let's see. It's usually a strong attachment. Oh, okay. Not a string attachment. (laughs) Okay. Thank you. Um, so, um, you know, having chit chat is something that is a skill that we need in society. You don't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be your favorite thing, but you need to be able to say, you know, when you go pick up your dry cleaning or something, you know, how's your day going? That's a great place to practice. At the grocery store, if someone's checking you out, you're not doing the automatic thing, you can say, um, Thanks for helping me. Um, you know, we can have a separate session on how to how to learn how to chit chat. I'm happy to do that. Um, chit chat is 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 really tough because it's not it's not it's like um, it's like a little bit of sugar. You know, it's not like a, a chocolate chip cookie, but it's like two chocolate chip morsels. So it's not overly satisfying, and you might find it even cloying the sweetness. So. Um, I, I think that if you can have like a few fallbacks for chit chat that just are in your pocket um, that will take you in various situations, uh, then you can kind of, um, you know, adapt. Um, Tina says, I can't ever shut up and repeat myself. I try mindfulness, but my anxiety does it. Plus, I freak others out with TMI or seeing nosy because I discuss deeper personal stuff. So just remember pacing. Not everyone can go deep as quickly as you can. It doesn't mean that they can't go deep. It's just that their their pacing might be different. And that's something that I would really add to our list of having conversations, which would be pacing um, in terms, you know, in terms of depth. Okay, well, um, thank you so much uh, for joining me today. I really enjoyed this conversation. And um, again, sorry that the downloadable did not work. Um, And so um, I I really want to um, appreciate you. I actually won't be back for a little while. Um, I'm having the privilege of uh, speaking and traveling to Australia. So I'll see you back for this Facebook Live in late May. Have a great week and a good month, and I'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye.